Tonight, I'd like to speak to you on the subject of what will happen to America in the last days. And just before I begin and take you into the Bible, I want to say that I love America. I'd like to say that I'm a patriot. I'd like to say that there's a whole lot more right with this nation than wrong with this nation. I am not one of those preachers that stands and attacks America. I love America. But I'm also honest enough to look you in the eyes and tell you America is in desperate trouble. America has forgotten God. America is in a death spiral. And I fear that short of a supernatural spiritual awakening that this nation is not going to recover. And so tonight I have studied, I have prayed, I've put a lot of work into this, but I want to take you into the Bible and the purpose of this message, what will happen to America in the last days, is I want to show you four biblical scenarios that I believe pass the test of biblical interpretation and scholarship. And then I want to, in that last scenario, show you what I believe the weight of biblical scholarship rests upon. In other words, of these four possible biblical scenarios for the future of America in the last days, there's one that seems to be the path that we are currently on. I'm reading out of the ninth Psalm and the fifth verse. I'm going to read in Psalm 9 verses 5 through 8, and then I'm going to read verses 15 through 20. If you have a Bible and are sitting next to someone that does not have one, if you'd be kind enough to share. Here the psalmist wrote, You have rebuked the nations and destroyed the wicked. You have erased their names forever. The enemy is finished in endless ruins, and the cities you uprooted are now forgotten. But the Lord reigns forever executing judgment from his throne. He will judge the world with justice and rule the nations with fairness. Go down to verse 15. The nations have fallen into the pit they dug for others. Their own feet have been caught in the trap they set. The Lord is known for his justice and the wicked are trapped by their own deeds. The wicked will go down to the grave. This is the fate of all the nations who ignore God. This is the fate of all nations who ignore God. This is the fate of all nations who ignore God. Verse 18, but the needy will not be ignored forever. The hopes of the poor will not always be crushed. Arise, O Lord, do not let mere mortals defy you. Judge the nations. Make them tremble in fear, O Lord, and let the nations know they are merely human. Every day when the sun rises over our nation's capital, the early morning sunlight falls upon the tallest structure that's located in Washington, D.C. The Washington Monument stands at 555 feet and 55 feet at its width and base. It overlooks 69 square miles, which compromise what we know as the District of Columbia, capital of the United States of America. It's made of 36,000 stones of marble that were cut in Maryland and granite from my home state of Maine. And it weighs, if you're interested, 69,000 tons, upwards with the reconstruction of 90,000 tons. It was designed so that the first light of every new day in the capital of the United States of America touches the capstone of the Washington Monument before it touches any building, any structure there in our nation's capital. 
On top of that is a capstone. At the very top, a nine-inch aluminum pyramid capstone, which completes the top structure as it narrows to a point made out of 100 ounces of pure aluminum and part of the lightning protection system of the Washington Monument. Carved on the east side of that aluminum capstone, purposefully by architect, by designer, and by the leaders of our nation at that time, they had these words carved. And those words are laus deo, which is Latin for praise be to our God. By purposeful design at the dawn of every new day in our nation's capital when the sun and the first light of the sun illuminates these words of consecration in our capital. Praise be to our God. From atop this magnificent granite and marble structure, the 800,000 plus to million annual visitors are able to take a view, a beautiful panoramic view of the entire city, which as many of you know, is divided into four segments. And from that vantage point, one can also, also see the original plan of the designer. And it's a perfect cross there on the landscape of Washington, D.C. by design. The White House is to the north. The Jefferson Memorial is to the south. The Capitol is on the east. And the Lincoln Memorial is on the west, completing from the top of the view a beautiful large cross in the very epicenter of our nation's capital. I wonder how many of our young people and our children and our grandchildren have ever been read the very first prayer over this nation by our very first president. If you've never heard the very first president's prayer on inauguration day, let me read to you the exact words of George Washington as he dedicated our nation to God. Quote, Almighty God, we make our earnest prayer that thou wilt keep the United States in thy holy protection, that thou wilt incline the hearts of the citizens to cultivate a spirit of subordination and obedience to government and to entertain a brotherly affection and love for one another and for their fellow citizens in the United States at large. And finally, O oh God, that thou wilt most graciously be pleased to dispose us all to do justice, to love mercy, and to demean ourselves with that charity, humility, and temper of mind, which were the characteristics of the divine author of our blessed religion, and without a humble, humble imitation of whose example in these things we can ever hope to be a happy nation. Grant our supplication, we beseech thee, through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. End of quote. Those were the words, and those were the words of prayer uttered by the first president at the very first inauguration. Those who deny that America is a Christian nation simply have either failed history or they have sat in classes where God and the Bible have been redacted from the pages of censored history books and been rewritten by a godless and liberal academia with a political agenda. Since God rules over all, he determines the existence and the destiny of the nations of the world. The Bible does not provide exhaustive information about all of the nations in final Bible prophecy. But you might be interested to know that it specifically addresses 15 nations in final Bible prophecy by name. Number one, Israel. Number two, Jordan. Number three, Egypt. Number four, Sudan. Number five, Russia. Number six, Iran. Number seven, Iraq. Number eight, Europe. Number nine, Central Asia. Number 10, Syria. Number 11, Greece. Number 12, Saudi Arabia. Number 13, Libya. Number 14, Lebanon. And number 15, Turkey. All 15 of those nations are carefully addressed in the pages of final Bible prophecy and the final outcomes that God has set in motion. To think that a, a America is going to last perpetually is simply wishful thinking. 
Historically, all nations and all empires have had an expiration date. There is much debate among historians concerning the exact beginnings and ending dates of great historic empires. However, these dates will give you a simple idea as to the length of notable empires. The ancient Babylon Empire lasted only 86 years. The Persian Empire lasted 208 years. The glory of the Greek Empire lasted roughly 350 years. The Roman Empire existed from 27 BC to 476 AD with the fall of Rome. There's debate among historians concerning that length of time in the Roman Empire, but it faded from the face of the earth. The British Empire only endured for about 250 years. America has already celebrated a bicentennial, but sadly we are beginning to fall into the exact same sin, debauchery, corruption, ego, political bent that has moral rot throughout it and that has destroyed every nation who has ever tolerated in history. America's odds of celebrating a tricentennial are not looking good if we do not have a dramatic spiritual awakening in this nation. I give that to you as a brief thumbnail in history as we talk about four biblical scenarios for what will happen to America in the last days. And I hope that I can carefully articulate these tonight. For those of you that are taking notes, number one, the very first scenario that I see as a possibility that will not violate Bible interpretation is this. Scenario number one is that America may still be a powerful nation in the last days, but the Lord simply chose not to give her attention. In final Bible prophecy, the dominant political and military powers at the end of time found in Bible prophecy are centered in the Mediterranean region and also in Europe. The scriptural silence concerning America seems to indicate that by the time the Great Tribulation period arrives, America will no longer be a major influence in our world. Dr. John Walford, and for those of you that enjoy Bible prophecy, Dr. Walford has gone home to be with the Lord many years ago, but he's one of the greatest authors and one of the most prolific writers of Bible prophecy and a genuine man of God. But he wrote this in one of his books, and I want to read it to you word for word. Quote, Dr. Walford said, although conclusions concerning the role of America in prophecy in the end time are necessarily tentative, the scriptural evidence is sufficient to conclude that America in that day will not be a major power and apparently does not figure largely in either the political, economic, or religious aspects of the world." End of quote. The silence in the Bible concerning the fate of America in final Bible prophecy has always haunted me as an evangelist. I have had a love for Bible prophecy since I was a child. Many of you know that my father has gone home to be with the Lord, but my father was a pastor and served the Lord in full-time ministry for almost 70 years. My mother is still alive at the age of 88, and I'd appreciate if you'd remember her in your prayers as she's facing some physical battles as I speak. But I was raised in a home. My mother is perhaps the most godly woman I have ever met in my life. And as a child, my father oftentimes would bring in a handful of evangelists that he had trust in, one of which was one who focused his ministry upon Bible prophecy. He also has gone home to be with the Lord. His name was Dr. David Allen Lewis. But as a child, Dr. David Allen Lewis impacted my life. Back in those days, it was fairly common for those that taught on prophecy to show up at the church and they had charts that would be strung across the entire walls of the church with incredible details that further complicated everybody's understanding of prophecy. <laughs> A dear friend of mine who's aged now sent me one of those great prophecy scrolls that was hand painted by Dr. Dake that I cherish. 
I've actually thought about breaking it out and putting it in the backdrop of some of our meetings just as a reminder of the way it used to be. But I want to tell you something. Though I have preached on Bible prophecy and been a student of Bible prophecy for 40 years, now more than ever before, I probably purchased and read at least 20 or 30 prophecy books. And I'm not talking about quick reads. I'm talking about academic, thick books. I love Bible prophecy. I have lived long enough to see how important it is to the hour in which we're now living. I had no idea when I began evangelism 40 years ago that I would live long enough to see the things that I studied in prophecy unfold before my very eyes. To be honest with you, I'm quite shocked at how quickly America has fallen away. I am bothered as I see the nation that I love not only forgetting God, but assaulting God. Not only turning their backs on God, but cursing God. Not only forgetting God, but targeting His followers. America is on a desperate path, and I'm very concerned. And now at this age of my life, I think I better understand why as I studied American Bible prophecy, I always had this haunting feeling in my spirit. And I'm going to be honest with you. That haunting feeling of America being suspiciously absent in Bible prophecy bothers me more today than it ever has before. Scenario number two. America is not mentioned in final Bible prophecy because she will be destroyed by other nations. This scenario has debate and intelligent backing in the pages of Scripture because we know that in the end there's going to be at least a third world war. Many great Bible scholars predict a total of seven world wars before the second coming of Jesus Christ. We've had two, and there are many that I respect that make great biblical arguments for five regional world wars in the Bible. I'm not comfortable enough to take that into a pulpit and preach it, but I'll show you before the night is over that I think by absolute biblical definition, words that were written reference a nuclear war. Some scholars who present this theory point out the possibility that America may be one of the nations that's eliminated in a nuclear war. We certainly know that they stand on the floors of the United Nations on a regular basis promising that they're going to wipe us off the face of the earth. Many of you have heard the speeches of the luminaries and the world leaders who have stood on the floors of the United Nations with profanity pledging their hatred of us and Israel and that their goal as a nation is to wipe us from the face of the earth at all costs. It's not as if this is a veiled threat. It is something that is heard on a regular basis on international floors and conclaves. There are multiple passages in Bible prophecy that seem to describe in detail the possibility of a nuclear war. If you have your Bible, I'd like to show you at least one. Open to 2 Peter chapter 3. The Apostle Peter wrote two letters. And in 2 Peter chapter 3, go down to verse 10. And let me read verses 10 through 12. There the Apostle Peter wrote these words. Listen carefully. But the day of the Lord will come as unexpectedly as a thief. Then the heavens will pass away. Let me pause right there. You have to remember that the Apostle Peter, nor any of these first century authors, would have had anything to compare the might of a nuclear war. Peter wrote this when many of the nations were still using swords and spears and shields. Some of the advanced had boiling oil systems that were poured off of the tops of the walls and the gates that protected their towns. The technology of a nuclear bomb would not have been possible by any imagination or creativity. But he said the heavens will pass away. Did you know that in modern nuclear warfare, nuclear bombs no longer explode by impact or detonation? 
They are not dropped and in hitting the target, explode. They are very carefully built with altimeters just like a plane. And modern nuclear bombs are set off to explode, science uses the word, in the heavens above the target. The Bible speaks of various levels of heaven, one of which is the atmosphere above the earth. The same Greek word is used here, the heavens will pass away. For example, if they were to target Washington, D.C., it's very likely that that nuclear bomb and its altimeter would have been set for somewhere between three and 600 meters above the city. And the nuclear bombs of modern warfare explode in the heavens above the target and the devastation goes down before the devastation goes up. Peter said, then the heavens will pass away with a terrible noise. Spears didn't make terrible noises. Crossbows didn't make terrible noises. This word terrible noise. Many scholars of prophecy have wondered if perhaps Peter in writing it had some type of apocalyptic vision himself like the author John in the book of Revelation. Then he went on to say, and the very elements themselves will disappear in fire. Many of you are old enough to have watched the films of Hiroshima and Nagasaki and the epicenters where America dropped those nuclear bombs. It was said in many of the books that detailed the aftermath that the epicenters, all of the buildings, all of the populations, all of the bridges, in the aftermath, it was said in one book, it was as if they had disappeared from the face of the earth, nothing left. Not a single steel beam, not a single structure. The epicenter wiped clean and scoured from the face of the earth. The heat of those bombs was so intense that for about a 20 mile radius, human bodies literally evaporated with the heat, bones and all. The apostle Peter said the very elements themselves will disappear in fire. And then he went on to say, and the earth and everything on it will be found to deserve judgment. Some Bible scholars have argued, could this be a veiled reference to nuclear fallout and radiation poisoning? Then he went on to say, since everything around us is going to be destroyed like this, what holy and godly lives you should live. Looking forward to the day of God and hurrying it along. For on that day he will set the heavens on fire and the elements will melt away in the flames. Again, strange words for a first century author in primitive warfare. The elements will melt away in the flames. Once again, the purpose of sharing this with you and giving you some insight as to how scholars have tried to debate this is not to give fear and not to give you sleepless nights, but I'd like you to focus rather upon the words of Peter where he said, since everything around us is going to be destroyed like this, what holy and godly lives you should live. We don't know what tomorrow may hold. We don't know the exact details of what will happen in this world and in our own nation. But one thing we do know is that the promises of God are yea and amen. One thing we do know is that heaven and earth will pass away, but the word of God will never pass away. One thing we do know is the next major prophetic event is the rapture of the church, and we should be living ready to meet the Lord every day. Amen. It's my purpose for being here. It's why I took time before I ever spoke tonight to address those of you that are guests and visitors and to plead with you. And in the moments to come, I'm going to give an invitation. And I'm going to challenge you to do tonight what I've seen over 600,000 people that I know of in 56 countries of the world do. And that is to bow before God and to pray with me what many people call a sinner's prayer. 
You know, I've taken criticism through the years by those who perhaps don't enjoy the work of the evangelist or those who no longer believe in calling people to repentance. And I've had people that have said in, in, in rings of scholarship where I've sat at tables, do you really believe that people praying a simple prayer with you at the end of one of your messages can really change lives and eternal destinies? My answer to that is if you read the Bible, there was a thief one on one side, one on the other side, two thieves in total being crucified with Christ, but one who turned to him in the final moments of his life and said, Jesus, if you're really the son of God, have mercy on my life. Five words. And in those five words, Jesus turned to him and said in his dying moments, today you will be with me in paradise. If by God's grace you make it into your eternal reward, if by God's grace you are welcome into heaven and have the eternal life that comes through the cross in Christ alone, it'll be because you did what that sinner did. It's not the length of your prayer. It doesn't matter if that prayer is in a fancy church or on an old rugged cross. What matters does it come from a sincere heart. And when a person turns to Christ with a sincere heart, recognizing that they've sinned, recognizing that they've failed God, recognizing that they've fallen short of His holiness and His commandments, and turns to Him and said, simply have mercy on my life, you also will hear the power of the Lord speak to you in confidence you will be with the Lord one day in eternity's morning and that's my prayer for every listener if you believe it and receive it give the Lord a mighty hand of praise that's my prayer for every one of you that are watching on a video on a telecast listening on a podcast stumbled across our ministry on Google and Bible prophecy it is not by accident that you are listening. God loves you and cares about you and you can pray that prayer with us in the moments to come and begin your walk of faith this day. Amen. Others propose a theory that a group of nations will ally together and succeed in an overthrow of our nation in a weakened condition. We are in a weakened condition. It almost seems that those that we have put in charge of the care of this nation have purposely put us in a weakened condition. Stop and think for a moment. They've told us don't go to work, don't go to school, don't go to church, don't go out, don't support capitalism. It seems as if there is a demonic plan to make our nation weak in these last days for perhaps this very type of scenario. One of my fathers in the faith, still alive at the age of 95, I visit him on a regular basis. Dr. Benjamin Crandall, he was David Wilkerson's spiritual father, pastored a great mega church that he built and pioneered in Brooklyn, New York, back in the days when nobody had a church bigger than 100. And served that city for 40 years of his life, eventually became the president of North Point Bible College and Graduate School. I've had many discussions with Dr. Crandall on the scriptures and Bible prophecy. Something that Dr. Crandall shared with me many years ago has always bothered me. Dr. Crandall, in his words, he said, Tiff, America is the only nation that has sowed nuclear bombs and God's word says whatsoever a man soweth that shall he also reap America has sown two nuclear bombs and in final prophecy I believe they will reap the fruit of those actions there's something inside me as a patriot that would like to believe that that was done for the defense of freedom and democracy and and to save lives, but I have to be honest with you, his words still bother me. America has sown nuclear warfare, and in the end, America must reap nuclear warfare. I pray that that scenario is not true, but that's beyond my control. Scenario number three, 
The third scenario is that America is not mentioned in Bible prophecy because she will have lost her influence as a result of moral and spiritual deterioration. In other words, America will not be destroyed from allied nations that attack us from the outside. But like the great Roman Empire, America will fail and America will fall because of the corruption of leadership on the inside. There are many that could make a strong theological and intellectual argument for this scenario. It seems like we have let the state institution loose and all of those that inhabited the state nuthouse are in charge. It seems like people say things now that intelligent people just scratch their heads and say, did I really hear an intelligent American leader say such a thing? And I'm talking on both sides of the aisle. Quite honest, I'm telling you from my heart, take it for what it's worth. I have no faith in man. I have no faith in man's ability. I have no faith in our leadership. I have no faith in our politics. I have no faith left in this government. I have faith alone in the word of God. And I've purposed in my heart, I'm going to serve the Lord. I'm going to follow in his covenant. I'm going to walk out his word and trust the Lord until the sound of the trumpet My life is not under the control, nor is your life under the control of any political power. The word of God is greater than anything that's in this world, any institution, any authority, any government, any world leader. God is above all, and he will take good care of his people. Proverbs 28, 2, when there is moral rot within a nation, its government topples easily. But wise and knowledgeable leaders bring stability. Highlight those two words, wise and knowledgeable leaders bring stability. Let me add a little personal commentary Strike one, strike two. It seems like we no longer have wisdom and we certainly don't seem to have knowledgeable decisions. As you can imagine, this is a very popular view today in light of the moral and the cultural and the political and the economic war that surrounds all of us as I speak. Proponents of this view have no trouble citing the alarming statistics of drug use and violence and racism and alcoholism and teen pregnancy and children born out of wedlock and divorce and pornography and abortion and homosexuality and pedophilia and on and on. It seems that the moral rot of this nation is not lessening, but it is increasing. And you may not like this, but you're listening to a preacher that loves you enough to tell you the truth. This is a preacher that starts in the Bible, stays in the Bible, and finishes in the Bible. You may enjoy listening to all of those false prophets in social media who keep promising you that the world's going to turn to gold overnight. But the Bible tells me in prophecy, in the last days there will be a great falling away from faith and if possible the very elect will be deceived the bible tells me lawlessness will abound the bible tells me they'll call good evil and evil good the world is on a path of corruption and sin and destruction and ungodliness but not the church the church is covered by a prophecy in the fourth chapter of proverbs you may not think of the book of proverbs as a prophecy book but in Proverbs chapter 4 this holy Bible said the path of the just is as a shining light that shines more and more unto that perfect day the church is not going to fail the church is not going to become corrupt the church is not going to lose its way Jesus said I'm going to build the church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it I don't know about you but I've made up my mind I'm going to be a part of the victorious church of Jesus. Hey, give God a mighty praise. (laughs) Lastly, and I close with this scenario number four. Scenario number four is going to need a little biblical context. 
First, America is the number one ally and defender of Israel. As a student of the Bible, that carries weight because God keeps covenants and God does not revoke or go back on his promises. There are only two kinds of promises in the Holy Bible. Some would say there are upwards of 33,000 promises in the Bible, but all 33,000, if so, fall into two categories, conditional and unconditional promises. Let me give you an example of an unconditional promise. Matthew 16, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. That was given by Jesus Christ to his disciples. The Bible tells us in Matthew 16 that Jesus one day took his disciples for a walk and they went to a place called Caesarea Philippi. But Jesus didn't stop in the center of town. He began to walk on the outskirts of that town and then he began to head towards a very frightening area in that region. Outside of Caesarea Philippi was a large hill. And at the base of that large rock hill was a dark cavernous opening. A cave that was feared for generations. Because for generation the nightmare tales went that cave is the entrance to hell. No doubt every one of those disciples as a small boy had sat around the campfire with their father or their uncle or their grandfather or their brothers and the horrors and the tales and the Sasquatch stories and the Bigfoot stories and the ghost stories of that cave outside of Caesarea Philippi. We're told around campfires that bristled the hair on the back of those boys' necks. And probably not a single one of those disciples had ever been there in person. But the scripture tells us that Jesus walked them to the very entrance of that, that cave. They all believed for generations this is the entrance to hell. This is where Satan and all of the demons go in and go out. You can only imagine through creativity and imagination how they were feeling as Jesus is getting closer and closer to this cave. But it's at that very location that scholars tell us that Jesus then pronounced these words. Men, I'm about to build a church and the gates of hell will never be able to prevail against it. You have to understand that there was no church when Jesus said this. The only thing even close in type and in shadow would have been the synagogue and the temple, but certainly not a church, unlike what he had prophesied and promised. But as Jesus promised, and by the way, Matthew 16 and 17 is not only the promise of the Lord Jesus, it is the prophecy of the Lord Jesus. It is an unconditional promise. In other words, there is nothing that can invalidate it because it was spoken by the Son of God who is sinless and perfect in all of his ways. The son of God who said, I do nothing except that which I am directed to do by the father. The son of God who said, I only carry out the will of God and do what pleases him. By the will of the father, the Lord Jesus said, I'm going to build a church and then pointed perhaps at the cave and said, boys, the gates of hell will never prevail once I start building the church. It's important for you as a student of the Bible to understand what the church age is. Because to understand Bible prophecy, you must understand the church age. When did this prophecy come into fruition? When was it fulfilled? The church age began in the book of Acts in the upper room. When does the church age end? It ends at the sound of the trumpet and that next major prophetic event called the rapture of the church. The church age is from the upper room unto the rapture. You right now as a believer are a part of the church age, but the church age is about to close. But I want to remind you tonight on the last night of this lost lamb crusade that as long as you're connected to the church, as long as you are faithful to the church, as long as you have connected life, family, hope, business, and all faith to the holy church of the Lord Jesus Christ, Jesus 
Jesus said, I'm going to build it. That means in the Greek, it's going forward and it's going upward. How long? Until the rapture of the church. What are you saying, Tiff? I think you know what I'm saying. There is nothing in these last days that is going to stop the progress of the church. There is nothing in the last days that can invalidate the prophecy of Jesus. Greater is he who is in us than he that is in the world. And I don't spend my life running from devils, but devils run from me because I stand upon the promises of God. Hey! There is a fight in my spirit against every devil that would raise its hell against the mission of the church. We're not backing down. We're not going away. If you haven't figured out by nay, by now I'm a preacher's kid. I was born with red hair. My legal name is Tiffany. I fought from kindergarten through college. I had two knockouts in my first semester of Bible college. That's the truth. And there have been a few times I'm ashamed to say that people have flipped me the middle bird and I have followed them to the mall and pulled them out of their vehicles. Pray for me. I'm an ambassador of the Most High God. I am on a holy assignment and so are you. God, by his providential grace, has brought you under the leadership of a warrior. Your pastor does not spend all day Saturday getting his hair curled and his fingers manicured. God has blessed you with a pastor that spends time in prayer, spends time in the word, loves you, prays for you, guards you, protects you. If you're thankful for a glorious church that's going to be built under the coming of the Lord, give God a mighty hand of praise. Hallelujah. Our economic and military aid to Israel is billions of dollars every year. According to the Congressional Research Service from 1949 until recent years, America has given a minimum of over a hundred billion dollars to Israel. Why do I take time to give that to you? Because here's another unconditional promise. God said, I'll bless those that bless Israel and I'll curse those who curse Israel. But here's the dilemma that we're facing. Anti-Semitism sadly is having a revival in our nation and in our leadership. And many have already pledged that they will no longer stand by Israel with the same strength that we have. But in the pages of final Bible prophecy, Israel is pictured as a thriving nation. Though the Bible is a little ominous concerning the nation of America, though America is hauntingly absent from its pages, Israel is the very centerpiece of Bible prophecy. And God's covenant to Israel will never be revoked either. And the Bible said that when this world scene dramatically changes, Israel will still be thriving and no weapon formed against them will prosper. During the great tribulation, the judgment of God is going to touch Israel. But for a positive outcome, for the Bible says that during the great tribulation, all of Israel shall be saved. Bible prophecy tells me that in Israel, God is going to raise up 144,000 Jewish evangelists in the great tribulation. I didn't have time to preach it the other night when I preached to you on can I take the mark of the beast accidentally. But if you've heard me preach and teach through the years, you've heard me say that Satan cannot do anything unless it's a faulty counterfeit of what he has seen the Almighty do. And the mark of the beast is a faulty counterfeit because the first ones to be marked will be the 144,000 Jewish evangelists. God is the one who marks them, but his mark is not cruel. His mark is a divine protection. 
Revelation doesn't tell us exactly what that mark is, but the Bible tells us that he'll raise up 144,000 Jewish evangelists, 12,000 from each of the 12 tribes, and he'll mark them with some seal whereby no one will be able to kill them or harm them as they preach the gospel as to who the true Messiah of Israel really is. Prior to the second coming of that Messiah, God is going to send a revival to Israel and and all of Israel shall be saved. Until the rapture, it seems likely that the United States would continue to serve as Israel's chief ally. Secondly, under that last scenario, we know from Scripture that after the rapture that the Antichrist comes to Israel's side. And so this is something that I want you to think for a moment. Perhaps America has been Israel's greatest ally, but after the rapture at the beginning of the tribulation, Israel's greatest ally is the Antichrist, who comes out of the European nations. And once again, America is suspiciously absent. Where is America in that scenario? Why aren't we? clearly seen as Israel's greatest protector. Time will not allow me to peel deeply into that theology, but listen when I explain this to you, don't miss it. Something, this is not guesswork, this is Bible. Something happens to this great nation, either prior to or immediately after the rapture, that is not up for debate. A careful study and sound scholarship and proper interpretation of all prophecy passages allows me to say without doubt or hesitation that something happens to America either prior to the rapture or immediately after the rapture. The strong presence of Europe in the Bible and prophecy indicates that something will have happened to America that shifts world power back to Europe. The ten horns, the ten nations that walk and work with the Antichrist as the one world leader. The power shifts back to Europe in the end times. Thirdly, if America remains strong up until the time of the rapture, but it's been replaced by Europe as the world's superpower, what does that tell us? I close with these remarks. Listen carefully. And by the way, I believe the weight of scholarship of what I've presented tonight rests upon these concluding remarks and this concluding scenario. But I'll state that as such. It seems very possible that something's going to bring America to her knees either immediately before the rapture or immediately after the rapture. Let me explain to you why I believe the weight of scholarship rests upon this scenario. If the rapture were to happen today and all true believers in Jesus Christ were whisked away in a split second, I believe it would be the last straw of America as a nation. And I'll explain. The world and media would love for you to believe that Christians and born again believers are just a small handful of believers. Just a small handful. You've heard it said from political stages in recent days that were just a small group of Bible-believing, gun-toting, basket full of deplorables. But they hope no one will ever tell you what I'm about to tell you right now. We are not some small group of deplorables. According to the most recent studies, and I've spent hours trying to find accurate information, but according to the best of my research, there are conservatively 2.3 billion Christians in the world and still growing. We outnumber Islam. 
We outnumber Hindus. We outnumber Buddhists. We outnumber all Eastern religions. We outnumber Judaism. We outnumber agnostics. We outnumber atheists. We outnumber socialists. We outnumber communists. We outnumber Marxists. We outnumber idiots. We outnumber Antifa. We outnumber hate groups. We outnumber politicians. We outnumber the Senate. We outnumber the House of Representatives. We outnumber godless governors. We outnumber immoral mayors. We outnumber all religious institutions and we're not done yet. He will build his church unto the rapture and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. If you believe it and receive it, give him a mighty hand of praise. Hey! Consider these facts from Barna Research. 85% of Americans claim to be Christians. But I would say this group is what I would call cultural Christians. 41% of Americans claim to be born again Christians. This is a subset, again, of a broad Christian group. But according to Barna, this represents conservatively that in our country, 15 to 20 million American adults are more than likely followers of Christ on some level. And when you add in children's and families, that number conservatively might be in the area of 25 to 30 million Americans are followers of Christ on some level. Another poll records the number of evangelical Christians in America as 23% of our total population. That would place the total number of believers in America at 65 million if that were true. Now, I've given you some data and I've given you some poll numbers. Obviously, only God has access to the Lamb's Book of Life. Amen. But imagine the impact upon our nation the day after the rapture when that segment of our society is completely stripped from America. America would not only lose a significant part of its functional population, it would also lose its very best. It would lose the salt and light of this great land. Matthew 5, 13 and 14, the Bible says you are the salt of the earth. But what good is salt if it, is, if it has lost its flavor? Can you make it salty again? It will be thrown out and trampled underfoot as worthless. You are the light of the world, like a city on a hilltop that cannot be hidden. The Bible tells us that we are the salt. We are the light. We are influencing. We are the power that has protection. We are the power behind the scenes that has kept the wrath of God from touching. We are the power that has kept the judgment of God from being poured out in wrath. We are the power that will not be taken by any power other than the sound of the trumpet. We are the power that keep the Antichrist and all of the political scenarios at bay but make it known that when the church is taken out of this country it probably will be the end imagine millions of mortgages that go unpaid imagine all of the Christians in military leadership and personnel in untold numbers permanently able factory workers never showing up for work again college tuitions overdue Businesses left without key workers and leaders. Undoubtedly, the Dow will crash. The Nasdaq will plummet. The entire economy that has already been thrown into a place of unprecedented weakness will never survive the rapture of the church. I mean, think for a moment. There are nations on the face of this planet that won't even know the rapture took place. There are nations on the face of this planet that have so few Christians that when the rapture takes place, they'll only see of such things on their local news. A nation like Turkey will be unaffected by the rapture of the church. Various parts of the Muslim world will be unaffected by the rapture of the church. But not America. America as a Christian nation 
with the hidden number of Christians that they have done their best to demean and demoralize. We have not gone away. We are not some small group of deplorables. We are the mighty church of the Lord Jesus Christ. And the day after the rapture, you will mourn our loss for this nation will fall to its knees and collapse quickly. And America, I believe in that scenario, is erased from the pages a final Bible prophecy as God's eternal word shifts the focus to the Mediterranean region in Europe. America is gone. Let me put it to you very simply, and if you're taking notes, write it down and never forget it. The church can survive without America, but America cannot survive without the church. I don't say that boastfully. I say that in direct agreement with the promise of Jesus. He said, I'll build the church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Doesn't matter. All of these people that are assaulting conservatives and making threats. I have a word of advice for you. Don't poke the grizzly bear. The church will survive without America. But America will never survive without the church. As the musicians come, I close with one last passage of scripture of prophecy from the Bible. If you'd like to turn to 2 Peter 3, I'd like to read these few verses. 2 Peter chapter 3, verses 2 through 15. And I plead with you to listen carefully to the words of the Bible. Once again, the Apostle Peter in this second letter, he said, I want you to remember what the Holy Prophet said long ago and what our Lord and Savior commanded through your apostles. Most importantly, I want to remind you that in the last days, by the way, if you've listened all week, you know beyond the shadow of a doubt that you're living in the end times. In the last days, scoffers will come. Mocking the truth and following their own desires. They will say, what happened to the promise that Jesus is coming again? From before the time of our ancestors, everything has remained the same since the world was first created. They deliberately forget that God made the heavens by the word of his command. And he brought the earth out from the water and surrounded it with water. Then he used the water to destroy the ancient world with a mighty flood. And by the same word, the present heavens and earth have been stored up for fire. They are being kept for the day of judgment when ungodly people will be destroyed. But you must not forget this one thing, dear friends. A day is like a thousand years to the Lord and a thousand years is like a day. The Lord isn't really being slow about his promises, some people think. No, he is being patient for your sake. He does not want anyone to be destroyed, but he wants everyone to repent. But the day of the Lord will come as unexpectedly as a thief. Then the heavens will pass away with a terrible noise and the very elements themselves disappearing in fire and the earth and everything on it will be found to deserve judgment. Since everything around us is going to be destroyed like this, what holy and godly lives you should live. Would you pause there just for a moment? My dear friend, are you living a holy life? Are you living a godly life? For when the Lord Jesus by means of rapture comes, the Bible said he's coming for a bride that's pure and spotless and without blemish and without wrinkle. The blood of Jesus Christ is the only thing that can make you and I holy. And when you bow before God as I give the invitation and we pray the sinner's prayer on this last night of this Lost Lamb event, by praying with me, you're saying, God, I probably have fallen well short of being ready for your soon return. I probably have violated the commandments. And let's be honest, many of you have read the Ten Commandments, but you've always treated them like pick your favorite five. 
The Ten Commandments are not multiple choice. He's coming back for a holy people, a pure people. That's why every night I plead with people, while there is yet time, make peace with God. The Bible said, since everything around us is going to be destroyed like this, what holy, godly lives you should live. Looking forward to the day of God and hurrying it along. On that day, he will set the heavens on fire and the elements will melt away in the flames. But we are looking forward. This is for believers. We are looking forward to the new heavens and the new earth. He has promised. God's the only one that will ever have the successful new green deal. That's why I don't worry about it. I respect the planet. I honor the planet. But I can tell you right now, they can't even run the post office. They cannot make a new heaven and a new earth. But for the believer, the Bible says there will be a new heaven and a new earth that God has promised a world filled with God's righteousness. And so, dear friends, while you are waiting for these things to happen, make every effort to be found living peaceful lives that are pure and blameless. Again, are you living a peaceable life? Are you living a pure life? Are you living a blameless life? And remember, our Lord's patience gives people time to be saved. This is what our beloved brother Paul also wrote to you with the wisdom that God gave him. Don't miss this. Why has God delayed for such a long time? The Bible's very clear. It's said because of his patience, he is giving you time to repent, for he is willing that none should perish, but all should come to repentance. Before you leave tonight, I plead with you one last time. I don't know why, but in recent months, I oftentimes on the last night of one of our Lost Lamb events have this feeling in my heart. This may be the last time I'll ever have the opportunity to preach in Arlington, Texas. This may be the last time that I'll ever have an opportunity to personally plead with you. And I promise you that this week in my hotel room, I've prayed for you. I prayed today that God would help me to make the message clear, and I've prayed specifically that when I gave the invitation, as I'm going to do in a moment, that God by the Holy Spirit would reach to you. And where I have fallen short or perhaps failed in making this message clear, I've asked the Lord to go by my humanity and my frailty and by the Holy Spirit, allow you to feel the tug and the love of God allow you to hear the whispering and the conviction of the Holy Spirit that says, come home. Come home, you're running out of time. And tonight is your night. The decision that you make can literally affect where you spend eternity. There really is a heaven, there really is a hell, and you're going to spend your eternity in one of those two places. People always say, I just don't believe that a God of love could ever send anybody to hell. You're 100% right. If you go to hell, it'll not be because God sent you there. It'll be because on a night like tonight, when he extended a hand of mercy and prayer and forgiveness, your pride and your ego wouldn't allow you to receive his mercy. And if you go to hell, can I love you enough to tell you the truth? If you go to hell, it'll not be because God sent you there. It will be because you willingly rejected his son, Jesus, the cross and the blood that was shed for the forgiveness of your sins. And consequently, when you stand before a holy God in eternity's morning, your sin on that day will condemn you. That's why he said, all who call upon my name shall be saved. That's why he said, I'm willing that none should perish, but all should come to repentance. That word perish means face judgment for unrepented sin. You dare not stand before God with unrepented sin in your heart. By coming to this altar tonight, you're saying, I want to receive Christ. By coming to this altar tonight, you're saying, I want to be a real Christian. 
By coming to this altar tonight, you're saying, I don't understand everything about the Bible. I don't understand everything about Bible prophecy. But there's something in my heart tonight that wants to make peace with God. I want to be ready. I don't know all of the things that are going to happen tomorrow or next year. The Lord could come tonight while you're sleeping. Would you be ready to meet the Lord? I want you to have an absolute certainty before you walk out. Tonight I made peace with God. And tonight I know I'm ready to meet the Lord. If you believe and receive the word of the Lord tonight, give God a mighty hand of praise. I'm going to ask you to stand with me all across the sanctuary. And as much as possible, I'm going to ask you to hold steady. Because what we're about to do is the most important thing that we've done all night. I want to pray with you before we dismiss. Many years ago, before he passed away, Dr. Billy Graham had been invited as an elderly man to speak at Harvard University. Billy Graham spoke, and at the end of his message to the students at Harvard University, he took time for questions and answers. One of the young men stepped to the microphone, and when I heard this on a radio interview, I wrote it down word for word. And I memorized it because it was almost as if God seared it into my heart as an evangelist. That Harvard student, brilliant, cream of the crop, stepped to the microphone and said this, quote, Dr. Graham, tell me how I can know God, but please tell me in simple language that I can understand. End of quote. I wrote that down, and it was a moment of clarity and life decision for me. That's the job of an evangelist, to tell you how you can know God, but to tell you in plain, simple language that even your children and your grandchildren can understand. So on this last night of this event, here's how you can know God. I want to make it as simple as ABC. A, you have to admit your sin. There has to be a time in your life, according to the Bible, where you in humility and childlike faith acknowledge your sin. God, I know I'm a sinner. The Bible says all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. B, you have to believe in Jesus Christ. Not just believe that he was a great leader or a great teacher or a great prophet or a world revolutionary, but believe that he's the son of God. Believe that he loves you. Believe that he died on a cross for sinners. Believe that the blood he shed will wash you, and cleanse your mind, your body, and your spirit. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him will not perish but have everlasting life. And see, you must make a commitment to him. At some time in your life, you have to make a sincere, heartfelt commitment to Christ. The Bible says, neither is there salvation in any other, for there is no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. Acts chapter 4 and verse 12. Jesus said in Luke chapter 12, listen to these words, Jesus said this, he said, if you confess me publicly before men, I will confess you publicly before my Father which is in heaven. But if you're ashamed of me before men, I will be ashamed of you before the Father and the angels. Let me give that to you in straight Texas language. What you do with Jesus tonight determines what he does with you in eternity's morning. If you receive him here, he said, I'll receive you there. But sadly, if you reject him here, he said, you have forced me to reject you there. I plead with you one last time on this last night. Many of you that are listening to me will pray with me. It'll be the very first time in your life you've ever done anything like this. And it's going to take faith and courage and humility. 
I always ask the musicians sing a song of invitation in just a moment. Those of you that have the courage, will you please be the first ones to come? Your courage will help somebody that doesn't have the same courage you do. Christian, I'm going to ask you one last time to be very gracious and sensitive to the leading of the Holy Spirit. People that might be sitting close by, maybe someone you've invited. Maybe you have a family member with you tonight. Maybe a son or a daughter or a husband and a wife or a neighbor or someone you work with. Maybe there's somebody sitting next to you that's a visitor that came on their own. And you don't recognize them and you're not sure if they've ever made their own peace with God. Christian, will you be sensitive on this last night and as the invitation is given and they sing this song of invitation, will you just turn to them and say, if you'd like to pray, I'll walk with you. I'm not going to embarrass you. I'm not going to keep you. We're going to pray. We're going to do exactly and carefully what I explained to you we do when we make peace with God. Many people call it a sinner's prayer. It doesn't matter to me what they call it. The Bible says all who call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. I'm not going to push you. I'm not going to coerce you. I'm not going to pressure you. I'm going to trust by integrity that you can feel the tug of the Holy Spirit and the weight of your decision. I'm just going to kneel on this platform at this altar. And as they sing that song of invitation, I'm going to pray and ask God one last time today to give you the courage and the humility to make this decision. And if God's speaking to your heart, maybe you're backslidden away from the Lord and you need to come home. You've not been living a holy life. Will you come as God speaks to your heart even now? it one more time if God's speaking. Come on. Oh, the blood of oh, Jesus. Oh, the blood of Jesus. Oh, the blood of Jesus. It washes white We're going to pray with those of you that are at this altar. Listen very carefully. And even those of you that are viewing through some type of social media platform or broadcast or video or television, wherever you may be, maybe at home, maybe in a hotel room, maybe listening in a vehicle driving down a highway, wherever God has reached your heart, you may not be present in this live service, but somehow the love of God has found you and you need to come to Christ. When we pray with these that are here, you can pray wherever you're at there. Those of you that are at this altar, this is God's promise that is not my promise. He said, all who call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. I want you to understand this. When we pray, it's not going to work for 80% of you and 20% of you, it's not going to work. 100% of all who call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. I'm so proud of these young boys and the children that have made commitments to Christ this week. Every time I see a young boy or a young girl at an altar, I made my commitment to Christ when I was six. And this will change 
the destiny of your life, young or old. Pray this with me. Dear Heavenly Father, tonight as I was listening to the Bible, you were speaking to me. Down deep in my heart, I want to be a real Christian. I want to be ready in these last days to meet the Lord. Tonight I confess my sin and in childlike faith I'm willing to repent. I turn my back on sin and I turn my heart to Jesus. I trust in the cross and in the blood that was shed. Forgive me. Cleanse my mind, my body and my spirit. Wash me and make me holy in your eyes. I need your strength to live for you. Fill me with the Holy Spirit and give me your power to be what you created me to be. Tonight, I receive salvation. It is the gift of God, not by my works, but by your grace. Tonight I'm saved. Tonight I'm delivered. Tonight I'm healed. Tonight I'm blessed. The curse of sin is broken and the favor of God is now mine. I am no longer the property of sin. I am tonight a child of God and I'll never be the same. I vow I will serve you all the days of my life. Keep me ready for your soon coming and use me in such a way that all of my family, my loved ones, follow me as I follow Christ. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Give the Lord a mighty hand of praise. <laughs> praise the Lord. Those of you that prayed with me, what you did tonight is not the end, just the beginning of what God's going to do in your heart. Listen very carefully. Every successful Christian has four habits. They read their Bible every day. Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. Number two, they pray every day. That simply means acknowledge the Lord in all of your ways, and he said he'd direct your path, Proverbs 3. Number three, find a Bible-believing church with a godly pastor. I love you, appreciate you, and lastly, win your friends and family to Christ. I don't say this out of fear tactics. Bible prophecy, I say it thousands of times. Bible prophecy is not given to scare us. Bible prophecy is given to prepare us. But please hear me on these last words on my last night. Win your friends and family to Christ. We're running out of time. You say, how do I do that? Begin with prayer. Don't go home, knock them to the floor, and wrestle a Bible and thump them around the head and try to shove the gospel down their throat. One of the first things that you need to do is let your life be an example. And pray for them on a regular basis. Before you talk to men about God, you must talk to God about men. Only the Holy Spirit can convict people of sin and convince them of their need of Christ. And as a Christian purpose in your heart, I'll never be unkind again to anyone. I'll always be gracious. I'll always be prayerful. And by God's help, I'll live as Christ in the eyes of the world that surrounds me. And if you'll do those four things, the Bible promises me that you will walk in the blessing and abundant favor of the Lord all the days of your life. And just like Jesus said in Matthew 16, from tonight forward, your path will be forward and upward all the days of your life. If you believe and receive that, give the Lord a mighty hand of praise.